guess I want, I want to add that, uh, I mean, slowly I will go to, to uh, I don't know, more compli complex material, so I'll try to explain what I can, but I won't be able to do all the derivation. And for those of you especially who see it for the first time, you will be overwhelmed uh, uh, just by the amount of material which I'll try to present. I, I'll try to give many summaries of what we learned and so on, but if you are sort of interested in this topic, I don't think there is any other way that, uh, other than you go through it yourself at some other time and try to fill the gaps and so on. Uh, so let's move on. Let me just, as a disclaimer, I'll take a small detour. This is uh, a, a project, a kind of fun project, which was done with Peter Kleist, who is now in, in, in Dresden faculty. So um, I, I talked a little bit, I mean, about eigenstates as, as a way to define uh, quantum chaos. But let me actually say that this wigner dyson statistics, all these conjectures, they equally apply to classical systems. So, uh, and uh, I'll just flash some results without going into details and continue. So, and actually, uh, uh, may, maybe many of you heard about the Wigner function. So we can represent quantum mechanics entirely in the phase space without even introducing the objects like wave functions. We have our phase space, we have observables, but there are complications coming from the fact that we have product, uh, which is non-trivial, it's called Moyle product, and so on. So rules of quantum mechanics, they enter uh, uh, some uh, rules of manipulating with numbers. So, but inverse is also true. We can take a classical distribution and map it to wave functions. And they'll just briefly flash how it's done. So let's assume like, that we have some stationary distribution, which is, say, Gibbs ensemble for simplicity, but it could be anything else uh, technically. And then what I can do, I can just do a Fourier transform. So for those who know, it's like inverse while transform uh, 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 with respect to momentum. And then conjugate to momentum, I will call a coordinate, and I will call it relative coordinates, x1, x2. And coordinate x, I will call x1 plus x2 over 2. Right? And then I have to introduce some uh, epsilon, which, of course, in quantum mechanics is h bar, but I, I don't have quantum mechanics. I just have epsilon. And then I get a function which, has, which is a function of two coordinates, x1 and x2, right? And these coordinates could be vector coordinates. They can have many particles. It doesn't matter. And then if you stare a little bit, this function is symmetric, or even more precisely, it's, it's Hermitian, um, uh, if I uh, order in moment. Anyway, it's symmetric. Uh, I mean, the reason to see it is that generally, if I exchange x1 and x2, uh, it's sort of like changing, com uh, it's like doing complex conjugate. So I guess Hermitian is the right word. Uh, and if it's Hermitian, I treat x1 and x2 as discrete coordinates, I can diagonalize it. Right? It's and then I can write it as, as uh, 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 a combination of eigenstates of this matrix. And then I will have some eigenvalues Wn. And then I uh, uh, ask what's the properties of these eigenstates and eigenvalues. And it turns out that there are lots of parallels to quantum mechanics. So this science satisfy approximate Schrodinger equation. There's no time here. You can get tunneling, you can get Berry phases, band structures, and so on. Uh, and this is not semi-classical expansion, I just want to highlight. So you, you, you can set h bar to be one, like epsilon to be one. Uh, so, and it's interesting that in this formalism, which is actually kind of developed in 60s and sometimes in 40s, but that's for forgotten completely. So, you sort of reduce the phase space. You map continuous distribution of P of X P into set of discrete wave functions, psi n of X, like in quantum mechanics, and weights, which are like eigenvalues. And then in this language, uh, uh, your observables X and P become operators. And these are exactly the same operators which appear in quantum mechanics. So like in particular, if you want to compute average of P, this is the same as computing average of operator P in this eigenstates. And if you ask what's the Gibbs Hamiltonian, uh, which describes this eigenstates, uh, you can do high temperature expansion. Otherwise, it's, it's like a complicated problem. And then you will get actually your normal quantum Hamiltonian plus corrections. So I'll just show some pictures. Uh, so if you take uh, double well potential uh, and you set all parameters to be one, but you, you just put 
h bar to be 0.1, it's kind of small but not too small numbers, and you ask what's the lowest eigenstates of Gibbs distribution, actually get very perfect, nearly perfect uh, tunneling states. So you, you, you recover them right away. And moreover, if you want to compute level splitting between uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric eigenstates without these particularly small parameters, so like everything is of the order of one, and temperature you can even choose, uh, I don't say also 0.1, you can get accuracy like 10 to the minus 13. So this is really, a, so Gibbs distribution uh, knows about quantum mechanics a lot. So and then, uh, I, I'll skip this, you can get barrier phases, interference, and so on, and so forth. So let me just say related to this talk that actually you can apply Bohigas conjecture to the Gibbs distribution. So what I'm doing here, I'm just taking my Gibbs distribution, classical, of a particle in a cavity. Uh, sorry. Uh, in a cavity. In one case, it's the Sinai billiard, and in another, it's some ellipse integrable. Then I just take my Gibbs distribution, do a Fourier transform, and diagonalize it. In no quantum mechanics. And I ask, what's the distribution of eigenvalues? And in, in, in this first case, I get random matrix statistics. In the second, I get approximately Poisson statistics. So all these conjectures work. And basically, uh, this statement is that I can say whether the system is ergodic or not by just analyzing static photographs, no dynamics. So in order to get uh, this Gibbs distribution, say experimentally, I just do many, many photographs. Then I, I get the image. I just do Fourier transform, look what eigenstate, and I know whether the system is ergodic. Uh, it's kind of funny. So in a way, this Wigner-Dyson statistics and so on, it's not special to quantum systems. It's the way to see ergodicity, whether I'm quantum or classical. Anyway, so let me continue where I stopped. So uh, let's try to uh, apply random matrix theory to, to uh, observables and see what predictions are. And uh, I'll be... Uh, a little bit sketchy here, but as I said, I urge you to, to fill um, uh, the gaps if you are interested. So let's assume that we have some observable which is not random. So this observable is a matrix, and this is some non-random matrix in some basis. Say it's a fog basis, right? And this uh, observable could be a, I don't know, number, and then it will be diagonal in the fog basis. And then we can ask what... Uh, the matrix elements of this observable in eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. But if my Hamiltonian is a random matrix, these eigenstates are random, have random, these are random unit vectors, which are orthogonal, of course. So, and then uh, uh, what you will get, well, essentially you will get a simple expression. You have non-random matrix elements, and then you have these projections of random vectors on fixed axis, right? Think about each vector i and j as non-random axis. So this is my uh, Fox space in the Hilbert space. It, it looks like a you know, vector space, right? So, uh, well, if my vectors are random, then we can say that on average, uh, these projections are uncorrelated, except when I project the same vector to the same axis, then I get positive number. And on average, this number is one over n. Just think about three dimensions. You have, uh, say, random vector, which you pro project to three coordinate axis. So on average, you'll get one third, right, of weight uh, on each axis. And uh, uh, all other projections are uncorrelated. And actually, the higher the Hilbert space dimension, uh, the less fluctuations are. So it's basically uh, 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 the fluctuations around mean and variance will become smaller and smaller. So now if I uh, ask what's the expectation value of uh, uh, this off-diagonal matrix element, well, if alpha and beta are the same, it's on average zero. But if alpha and beta are the same, then I see that uh, i and j should be the same, right, by this rule. And then I immediately see that what I will get is that basically average of trace of O. And think about this. This is really a microcanonical ensemble, except that I sum over all energy states. But because I have random uh, 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 matrix and there are no like selection rules whatsoever, my microcanonical ensemble actually becomes 
infinite temperature average. There are no constraints, right? So, and this is sort of expected. If you start from a random matrix and you ask what's the average, well, uh, you will get uh, basically infinite temperature ensemble if we use statistical mechanics language, right? So then I said off diagonal observables an average zero, but if you compute their fluctuations, it's a little bit longer. So you have to take O alpha beta, take complex conjugate and square. But then it's very easy to see that you'll get some cross terms which are non-zero from the same rule. And then what you will find that you will get basically uh, fluctuations which are uh, one of a Hilbert space dimension squared times trace of O squared. And I just want to say that typically our observables don't scale with Hilbert space dimension, right? So therefore, this is, will be like sort of intensive, right? Because trace of O is your sum of all eigenstates, you roughly have N equivalent values, you divide by N and so on. And this becomes one over N. Again, one N will disappear because of trace, but another N will remain because in each state, O squared, think about O is like some spin squared or whatever, this doesn't scale with N. So we see that fluctuations are suppressed. So this is a prediction, and if we combine together, we can loosely say that our matrix elements uh, within random matrix approximation, given by in some average O times delta alpha beta, Kronecker delta, so diagonals are given by uh, basically this, I will use microcanonical with these caveats which I just explained, microcanonical value, and fluctuations are basically give on average one of a square root of n, uh, and with some distribution which uh, say we can choose Gaussian uh, such that square of this is roughly one. So, uh, and uh, I know this is a strong statement. Um, as usually, this is not exactly correct because if I start looking into high order correlation functions, like I start looking into O power four or whatever, I can get high order correlations even within random matrix theory. And I am skipping this uh, part completely, but there were like recent very nice work by Sylvia Popolardi, Jorge Chun, um, uh, Kurchan, and uh, uh, Laura Fiona. Uh, about applying a free probability theory and going beyond this statement. So basically, one can extend it to high order correlation functions. But anyway, this is a prediction of random matrix theory, but of course, we don't deal with random systems. But then, uh, um, uh, a major, I would say, breakthrough in trying to reconcile quantum mechanics and statistical physics uh, came due to uh, Mark Srednicki, who is uh, pictured here, and George Deutsch independently, who already like 30 years ago uh, generalized this uh, uh, random matrix theory uh, uh, to uh, normal physical systems. They were driven by the same idea that time average should approach equilibrium to basically say we know it happens, and then they uh, asked independently how they can reconcile uh, sort of these ideas of uh, barrier and the matrix theory with the fact that we should equilibrate to, to the thermal ensemble. And basically, uh, they said that in order to um, agree with thermal expectation, each diagonal matrix element now should be indeed microcanonical average, right? Because if you choose your distribution, narrowly uh, centered around some energy in order to uh, reconstruct a uh, microcanonical ensemble, this diagonal matrix element should be always the same for each state. And then details of what exactly these guys are not really important. Uh, and uh, they also, also thought a bit more and, and said that off diagonal matrix elements should have this, remember I said it's one of a square root of Hilbert space dimension suppression right, uh, and uh, Hilbert space dimension translates to e to the minus entropy. So, um, uh, and basically uh, the ETH ansatz, uh, which was formulated by, by uh, Mark Srednicki, states like this, uh, 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 yeah, it's, it's encoded in this uh, expression that if we take some, usually people say local, physical, whatever, observable, uh, and you ask uh, its um, 
uh, matrix elements, uh, about this matrix elements in eigenbasis of this ergodic Hamiltonian, then we will get microcanonical uh, averages on diagonals and some random uh, suppressed matrix elements away from diagonal, but there is an extra ingredient that there is some smooth function of energy difference. So omega here is En minus En. So basically, if you think random matrix theory would be that this OE is energy independent and this function f of omega is equal to identity. Right? So they introduced basically structure on top of random matrix theory ansatz. There's no proof behind, uh, but there are lots of numerical tests and, and it works. So what's the meaning of this function? So I'll decided to save time, I'll probably skip the calculation. Let me just say how it works. So this function is actually uh, related to, to um, uh, spectral functions, so Fourier transform of autocorrelation functions. And uh, it's very easy to derive uh, this, but it still will probably take me 10 minutes to go through derivation, so I'll skip it. So essentially, you look into non-equal time correlation functions, and that's not surprising that omega uh, appears as notation, at frequency omega of your observable. And then what you can do, you can insert complete basis of states, you insert m, m here, and then you integrate over time. And then if you do it carefully, you will see that uh, uh, this square of the spectral function, which, which uh, square of this function f squared, because it will appear, maybe I'll just show this, and then I'll skip. So what you do, you just, introduce some of intermediate states, right? And then here you will get uh, En minus Em, right? So this translates to sum over, uh, uh, sorry, sum over M, uh, N O M squared times E to the I En minus Em T over H bar, right? And this by ansatz, are precisely given by this little f squared of omega, right? And then when you evaluate integrals, uh, you have to be careful. When you take symmetric and anti-symmetric, you'll get delta function, principal value, and so on. So you need to uh, play a little bit with algebra. Uh, but essentially, uh, both symmetric and anti-symmetric correlation functions are expressed through the same of diagonal matrix elements. And then you can basically, with a uh, little effort, you will find uh, uh, what uh, this f is. And they just want, you, you might see beta here, and they just want to highlight maybe, yeah, this I think is important, that there is no Gibbs distribution. So temperature appears entirely from density of states. You probably know that temperature uh, is defined as uh, uh, through uh, derivative of entropy with respect to energy, right? So this is how density of states change. And when you have uh, this type of sums, then you will get F squared evaluated energy En plus omega over two. This is center of mass energy, right? Remember, omega is Em minus En. So what appears here in the matrix element is center of mass energy because it's completely symmetric. But then when you sum over states M, this sum becomes integral because ETH tells you all eigenstates are the same, right? So replace the sum by integral over DE, M, right? Or final energy, which I'll write D omega because you're integrating over energy omega. But then you will get density of states at energy E plus omega, which is EM, right? So you get E power S E plus omega from density of states and you get minus S of E plus omega over two from ETH ansatz. And now this omega E is usually extensive, right? Omega is of the order of one for local matrix elements. It's how much you can change energy, say, or it can flip a particle, right, from up to down state. So in large systems, you can do Taylor expansion. And this will be beta omega, and this will be beta omega over two. And that's how you get beta. 
It was actually missed originally in some original papers. Uh, it's a subtle thing. But if you do it correctly, you recover it. And then uh, maybe in, in the next 10 minutes, I'll just show how from ETH ansatz you can recover many statements of thermodynamics in one line. So in particular, uh, 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 again, like if you do play this game, you just see that this combination between anti-symmetric and symmetric function must be uh, small. It's d, this function dE, but e is proportional to volume. It's like one over volume. It vanishes in the thermodynamic limit. So you just see that this thing should be equal to zero because of ETH. But this is nothing but fluctuation dissipation theorem. If you remember it, there is like tangent of beta omega over two appears. It connects response and fluctuations. Again, I'm not going there, but uh, just to say S minus is your response. It's Kubo response. And S plus symmetric function is precisely your fluctuation. So fluctuation dissipation theorem just follows in one line from ETH ansatz. Uh, and actually, many other statements of thermodynamics follow. Uh, so I, I'll just show a couple. So maybe interesting. So maybe as some of you heard about yeah, Kierzynski and Crookes equalities. So essentially, they relate. So if you have some process, uh, dynamical process in the system, uh, uh, they ask uh, 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 about probability of doing work W, of basically increasing your energy uh, by, by energy W. And then I, uh, I'll show a result in a second, but I just want to say how it's easy to, to make the statements using ETH. So suppose I, I have a process, like I send light to the system, or I just I know, drop this, right? Or I hit it with a hammer. I do some process. And then as a result, I will get transitions between levels, right? And I can ask, what's the probability of increasing energy versus decreasing energy? And we all know that probability of increasing energy should be high, right? If I do something, I'm heating up, right? My energy increases. So, but my, microscopically, probabilities are the same. So you can just show that if the system is isolated, so I apply some time-dependent process, then probability to go from level M to level N is given by square of the unitary operator, unitary describing evolution. So it's beyond any perturbation, so it's really exact statement. So, um, and the square of the unitary is symmetric. So basically, probability of blue arrow and probability of red arrow are exactly the same. So do I contradict myself? No. Because we are not interested in probability of going from particular state to a particular state. We are interested in probability to, to go into some uh, window of energy, E plus W. And then I have to, as you know, I have to sum of all final states. Now, I use ETH. All probabilities are the same because all matrix elements are the same, right? Again, there, there is some smooth uh, function, but if I look into narrow energy shell, this function is always the same. I have the same energy difference, right? So what I get, I get basically this microscopic probability times density of states at final energy, E plus W. Now if I do a reverse pro process like arrow, I go from here to here, it's the same process, but now my final density of states is at energy E, and it's not the same. And now I ask what's the ratio of these probabilities, and then I see it's a ratio of densities of states. And again, if my W is small compared to total energy, I can expand it and think for simplicity that I have a cyclic process. And this is just E power beta W. If you're more careful, you'll also find free energy. Right? And uh, uh, this is actually a, uh, this uh, simple statement led to, to a very uh, uh, actually famous uh, Yerzinski equality, which you can get in one line from here. I just move e to the minus beta w to the left, and this probability of reverse process to the right, and integrate over w. This will give me 1, and this will give me average of e to the minus beta w. And then it's interesting. Uh, it's actually one of these famous results because it's totally independent of any details. Uh, uh, it just tells us that whatever I do, if I measure probability of um, uh, doing work uh, and measure average of e to the minus beta w. Beta is initial temperature, w is energy change. I will actually get exponent of equilibrium energy change for the same uh, 
uh, change of parameters. So if I do a cyclic process, this is, uh, this is one, because my free energy doesn't change, I come back. So I get average of e to minus beta w is one. This is one of this uh, recently found equalities. Actually, to be honest, it was found before, but it was not really appreciated until recently, and it's used a lot. So another very famous example you know about detailed balance. So let me now assume that A is some simple system, could be, say, three-level atom. It doesn't satisfy ETH or anything. And then I couple it to a bus, which satisfies ETH. So it's like big chaotic system. And then uh, I uh, couple them, let time evolve. And then I also ask, what's the probability of blue process versus red process? Blue process is when I go from down state to up state, and then because I have to conserve energy in the bus, I have to go down, and in the red process, I do opposite. Again, microscopically, these are the same by unitarity of evolution. They're completely equal to each other. But you already see from the picture, I have more states in B for the red process. So I have more states there. So it looks like red process should be more probable. And this is the origin of your detailed balance. And again, from ETH, I require it in one, uh, in one line. So I just say, what's the probability then within A, I go from state N to state M, versus the probability that I go like down. And again, what I need to do, I need to sum over all final states of B, because I'm not asking from them. And then I will get density of states only in reservoir B, because I'm summing over, over B, at different energies. And the ratio uh, is just e to the minus temperature of my reservoir B times energy. And this is detailed balance. So I, I got it from ETH in one line. Actually, you can go through many, many thermodynamic relations. And if you assume ETH, you just prove all of them. This is all I know. Uh, so I just want to highlight again, ETH is not necessary condition for thermalization. At least it was never formulated as such, but it's sufficient. And uh, uh, it's um, uh, kind of interesting that uh, initially this quantum chaos or ergodicity were very complicated and people couldn't really understand how to describe uh, quantum chaos or ergodicity for a long time. But at the end, they uh, developed language which made all statements much easier because when you say it formulates same, uh, um, uh, you do basically a equivalent statements in classical physics, you have to say many more words. That you forget memory, blah, 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 blah. Here you just say there is one ansatz which you can use. So then another uh, statement, I, I, as far as I said, Norm uh, will talk about this in, in uh, your lectures, that another thing which follows from ETH is, is this in, sort of entanglement. So if you take, uh, I have like a simple cartoon, so let's imagine, so this is even non-interacting system. So and let's imagine I have a uh, superposition of uh, uh, a particle in all three states. So this is my square well with only three positions for simplicity. And I want to contrast it with localized state where a particle is in one position. And now let's imagine that I, I just don't measure the right position at all. So it's like I have a black screen there. So I can only get information uh, from these two states. And then uh, you immediately see that in this case, I still find a pure state. So I always get the same result because particle will be in the second well. If particle was in the third, again, I will get the same result. I will never see a particle in the system. But if I'm delocalized, then I will see this probability one third, I will see no particle. And this probability two thirds, I will see a particle in this superposition. So I created entanglement in this case. And actually, ETH, uh, if you do it uh, sort of more carefully, uh, and there are actually mathematical works, uh, it says that if you uh, take a state which satisfies ETH, which is sort of random, if you look into reduced density matrix, it will look like thermal. So this is a much stronger statement than even these observables. Because it kind of implies that all local observables are thermal. So in few words, I mean, in simplified statement would be that ETH implies that in small systems, entanglement entropy is thermal entropy. Again, this is not necessary condition, but it's sufficient. OK, so now I'm slowly going to uh, uh, what I announce is that trying to distinguish 
chaos energeticity. And now I just want to highlight level statistics is really a measure of ergodicity. I even didn't define quantum chaos, but whatever definition is, we will all agree that this system is chaotic and we argue it's also ergodic. Well, if we just double it, so I have two boxes, this system is still chaotic in any sense. You cannot predict anything. But according to level statistics, or according to summarization, it's not ergodic, right? Because I now have two boxes. I mean, of course, this is like a trivial example, and it's clear what I need to do. I have to say, oh, there is extra symmetry, like particle conservation in each well, and so on and so on. But I need to start saying like some words. And then you can ask, what if they're weakly coupled, what happens, and so on. So in thermodynamic limit, chaos usually implies ergodicity. At least there are no counterexamples. I mean, some people talk about many body localization, but I, I think it's clear by now that there are many mistakes in, in those statements. Uh, so, and uh, then I'm slowly going to the second part. I will actually switch to, to another presentation shortly, is that uh, the idea we had, which actually was completely random, it's not that we purposely work on it, um, and um, yeah, I'm now slowly going to our own work from, from just general overview. So it came from Mahit Pandey, who was a student uh, at that time at BU, and, and he graduated already, and Dries Sells, who is now professor at NYU. And the idea was, that can we really try to approach quantum chaos not through sensitivity of trajectories, we don't have them, but through sensitivity of eigenstates. So, like classically, I, I, I mentioned that we define chaos through uh, the fact that if we change a little bit our system, could be initial condition, could be Hamiltonian, it could be something else, then our trajectories will strongly diverge from each other. So now, when in uh, the ergodic eigenstates, at least, we know that they are almost random. And then it's intuitively clear that if they are almost random, they should be highly unstable. So you change a little bit in your Hamiltonian, and then they will change a lot. And this is as opposed to integrable systems where we expect that eigenstates will be stable. Again, it looks like I'm going to purely quantum direction, and you might ask, oh, but we have level statistics and so on. But maybe in the rest, of this and next lecture, I'll try to convince you that actually this idea of sensitivity of eigenstates is not really quantum. It has well-defined classical analogs and they will hope, uh, hopefully I will show you how this idea connects many, many different dots. So, but before going there, let me kind of summarize the first part by saying that how we go from chaos or ergodicity, if you want, back to determinism. Uh, and how we have sort of this kind of uh, duality. I'm coming back to the very first picture when I, I have this blue drop of ink, which when it reaches chaos, this is, state becomes very simple. So you all, if, you, if you, any of you took any lab, like freshman lab in physics, you kind of did this pendulum problem, right? And you measured uh, the motion of the pendulum and compared with some damped uh, uh, oscillator and so on. And then you can ask, well, do I contradict myself? Because I just told you that even you know, two particles uh, or even one particle in, in more than one dimension is, is uh, 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 chaotic. And now I have a situation where I have many particles. I mean, this is like a setup. You can think this is particles of the air and they uh, hit you. So how is it possible that I'm deterministic when I'm doing my freshman lab, I don't know nothing about chaos, right? I just say everything is predetermined. Yes, we have extra friction and so on. And uh, actually, the reason that we have determinism is precisely chaos, if you think about it. Because we have a chaos, we can say that we have thermalization of molecules here, which have equal probability. So in a way, in mathematical sense, we give a measure to our distribution, right? We are saying equally probable on some energy surface. But then, because I can use central limit theorem. If I don't have a measure, I cannot use central limit theorem. I have to define that they should be this and this. So 
And if we use central limit theorem, we will find that macroscopic observables actually have very small fluctuations. And that's the reason why pressure in this room is the same everywhere, right? I have a lot of chaos around me, but pressure here is pretty deterministic. So, uh, uh, and, and uh, I want to say, yeah, and, and from this we actually see that uh, when we look into macroscopic objects like piston, then the motion is again deterministic. And we don't really need to solve any chaotic equations of motion. Moreover, if you try to solve them, we will be in trouble. So we, we use various like, approximations for extra born Oppenheimer and field and so on. So in a way, we see that there is a sort of a loop where chaos leads to determinism, determinism leads to chaos. What I didn't uh, tell you is that even if you think about uh, the whole dynamics of uh, uh, this whole thing, even Lagrangian equations of motion, in a sense, they also come to chaos, from chaos. But this will lead me away from this topic, so I'll skip it. So essentially, we see that friction, viscosity, pressure, electromagnetic response, elastic properties, whatever, 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 they come from chaos. So chaos leads, in a way, to probabilistic determinism. So very often, you might ask, like, why is it that I have a sort of a reversible micros microscopic dynamics, but irreversible macroscopic dynamics? And you know, people are discussing what's missing and so on. But uh, in a way, uh, there is no like, paradox, because uh, uh, what's happening is that chaos leads to probabilistic determinism, right? It's meaning that I go to probabilistic uh, descriptions, which are highly centered around maximum probability distribution. And that's the reason why friction is irreversible, right? So once I write kinetic equation, I don't deal with microscopic equations of motion. I deal with basically include assumption of uh, chaos implicitly that I maximally random within this constraint. So, and then the whole situation is also like in Chinese philosophy, yin and yang. So if you think about this, that determinism leads to chaos through unstable solutions, equations of motion, but chaos in turn leads back to determinism. Right, so we have statistical mechanics, which gives measure, and I mentioned central limit theorem, and then we can uh, make predictions again. So, and this is something which I guess is good to keep in mind. So I think this is the point when I want to switch to presentation two. Here I'm not really late. Well, see, I didn't finish it, but this is for tomorrow. I have sort of two presentations supposed to cover three lectures. So, and this is like part one of this talk, uh, which I already motivated and uh, I'll talk more about this. It's sort of a geometric approach to chaos and ergodicity. I will connect, uh, try to connect at least this eigenstate sensitivity to, to geometry and say how we can uh, think about chaos in this way. So I will start from like introducing different notions. And at some point, uh, there will be no complicated equations, but I, there will be a lot of new material for many of you. And it could be overwhelming. So I apologize in advance. I'll try to give a summary, because I'm going to relate this eigenstate sensitivity to many different things, and then in the end connect dots together. But then hopefully I'll show you some numerical results and some arguments and show like how, uh, what's the physics behind all of this. Yeah. Yes.
Uh, well, it's an excellent question. I, am, I will not be able to answer all of them. So what I will try to do now is to describe both quantum and classical systems uh, using the same setup, sensitivity of you think stationary observables. I introduced the stationary observables time average, so classically as well. And now I can ask, what if I slightly deform the Hamiltonian, how this stationary observable will change? So how this is related to Lyapunov exponents, we don't know yet. We are trying to work it out. It's direction, uh, relation is not that direct, but it's there. We, we know it's there. And maybe like two or three years from now, I will know how to answer this question. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to change gears. So I'm repeating what I just said. I want to highlight again that uh, 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 this is, yeah, I was not sure when I finished, so I, I thought I will start again reminding you the things, but since I just told them, I will not. So now let me spend some time of defining what adiabatic transformations are, and I will again start from classical systems. So again, the idea to keep in mind that eventually I want to ask what's the adiabatic transformation of quantum states, and I want to simultaneously talk about adiabatic transformations of classical trajectories. So I need to define what I mean uh, by adiabatic transformations. Quantum mechanically, we kind of know it. I'd still have to introduce some objects. Classically, we know it less. So I'll start from classical systems. So, and again, I will be skipping some calculations, but I, I hope to highlight main results. So. You, I will talk about Hamiltonian systems only because they have direct, uh, uh, at least connections between quantum and classical. And uh, everywhere in this talk, systems are closed. Actually, there is a parallel workshop on open systems. But another story, I guess. So you probably all know, at least you should know, that uh, time-dependent uh, evolution equations, you can think about this as canonical transformation generated by Hamiltonian. And canonical transformations are very, very important in classical physics because they preserve canonical Poisson brackets, right, which are analogs of commutation relations. So that's what we call canonical variables, which Poisson bracket is one. And they also preserve structure of equations of motion. And if you remember the proof that trajectory gives you canonical transformation, it's not based on the structure of the Hamiltonian. It's based on this uh, equations of motion that dx dt would be actually plus dh dp, and dp dt is minus dh dx, where h is basically arbitrary function. And I always assume they're all differentiable and so on. I'm not even discussing this. So, but now, uh, instead of h, I can take any other function. I will call it a. And I will call it generator of canonical transformations, continuous canonical transformations. It's actually related to generating function, if you know it, but this is a much easier uh, object. So this is arbitrary function of x and p. And then if I deform my trajectory, so this is, no t this is not a time evolution now. This is change of variables. I basically define x and p as a function of some continuous parameters. For example, I can rotate my space, or translate, or dilate, or do something else. As long as I have this function a, I get a new family, I, I mean, I get a family of canonical variables, x and p. So like example, so suppose I do translations. It's a very natural example. I have a particle in a box in a train, and then position of this box is, I call it lambda, I will use lambda for the parameter generally. Then if I want to, to deal with particle in the strain, whether it's moving or doesn't move, it's much more convenient to use coordinate representation with respect to the train, right? If I'm staying in this room and want to tell you something, I want to put my coordinate system somewhere here, right, around this room. Uh, but there could be some you know, lap frame uh, uh, where positions are measured with respect to, I don't know, say, Greenwich Meridian, some, some place in, in UK, right? So then I can say that, well, if lambda is position of my train, I will define my coordinate as uh, some lab. Not doesn't mean initial, it's lab. I, uh, but I didn't want to use L for various reasons. Some fixed coordinate, uh, 
minus lambda. And then I can ask, it's clearly canonical transformations, Galilean transformation, in fact, so momentum doesn't change. And I ask which, operate, which function uh, generates this transformation. So I, I use this game, I say dx d lambda is clearly minus one, and it should be minus d dp. And dp d lambda is just zero, it should be d a dx. I stare at it, I see that a is equal to p. So momentum generates translations in classical mechanics. You, of course, all know this about quantum mechanics, but in classical mechanics, the station is exactly the same. Let me do example two. So suppose I want to do another simple transformation, dilations. So I, for example, I can imagine I'm squeezing the box. I'll show it. Then I can say, well, I can take x and divide by some parameter lambda. But in order to preserve Poisson brackets, I need to multiply p by lambda. Otherwise, they will not cancel. And I can ask, what generates these transformations? Well, dx d lambda, I will get minus one over lambda squared, right? x naught over lambda will be x, so I'll get minus x over lambda. dp d lambda will be p naught, but p naught is p over lambda. So again, I stare at this and I see that x p over lambda is my generator, right? Because d a d p will be x over lambda with minus sign it will be this and uh, d a d x will be p over lambda and I will get this. Okay. So I'm not going through this example but I, I guess you can believe me now that if you do rotations around z axis your uh, generator of this canonical transformations will be angular momentum. Again like in quantum mechanics it generates. Now, why this is needed? So far, I'm not talking about chaos or whatever. It's just uh, generally when you uh, uh, can uh, use these transformations in practice, for example. So there is like a standard problem maybe many of you saw in, in Olympiads. Say you have a situation when a you know, particle moves in a box and the wall of the box moves and then how many collisions you have. It's a kind of standard. Uh, picture. And of course, you can solve it in some complicated ways, uh, find the current relation, and so on. But it's actually much easier to solve this problem is to say, let me actually go to coordinates where the box doesn't move, doesn't shrink. So I, I'll basically uh, 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 say x over this lam lambda of t is now a volume is my new coordinate, right? And then uh, I can ask, what will be uh, equations of motion in this system? And now you see what happens. So first of all, my particle moves on a box. So my dx dt will include dx dt at fixed lambda. But also a definition of the coordinate changes in time. Right? Because at each moment of time, by coordinate, I mean a different object, the x over lambda of t. So if I use a chain rule, I will also get dx d lambda times lambda dot. Right? So I just want to highlight, this is not a motion. It's the fact that I change definition of what I mean by x every time, right? So, but dx d lambda is, we said, dA minus dA dp, and then you will get dh moving dp. So you get, and then you can do the same for p. So you will get actually, again, Hamiltonian equations, but now you have a moving Hamiltonian, which is h original minus lambda dot a. So you manage to move a uh, uh, part which comes from coordinate transformation, to a new dynamical term in the Hamiltonian. So now, what you can do, you can solve the problem at fixed well, but now you have extra term in the Hamiltonian. And usually it's much easier. Now you can solve Hamiltonian equations, find how many collisions if you want, and so on. Oh, wrong direction. So now I want to go to, from general canonical transformations to adiabatic transformations. So and what are the adiabatic transformations? These are actually transformations which are trajectory preserving. So how I can motivate it? Well, let me go again to my time average distribution where I started, right? So basically now I, my um, uh, Hamiltonian is fixed. So I average over time, I get some stationary distribution. And generally, 
as we discussed, it will be a function of some conserved quantities. So in one dimension, it's only energy. It's microcanonical, we discussed, but maybe you have more. But then you see, if you had special perturbations which commute with Hamiltonian, then generally these coordinate transformations will not change. Again, there is an issue degeneracy. If you want, uh, uh, this is analog of statement that eigenstates will not change. So you can keep in mind that stationary states are like time average probability distribution. And you know in quantum mechanics, at least very well, that if you had perturbation which commutes with Hamiltonian and doesn't leave extra degeneracy and so on, I assume that this is not the case, then your eigenstates will not change. So basically it comes from the fact that if you add this diagonal or commuting perturbation, it still commutes with this stationary P. So, and uh, yeah, mathematically, it's just you, you say that if you have stationary probability distribution, which means it has vanishing Poisson bracket with H, it will also have vanishing uh, Poisson bracket with H plus V. So this is special perturbations, okay. But now I am dealing with generic perturbation. So I, I modify my Hamiltonian, I change parameter lambda, so it basically means my Hamiltonian goes to H plus derivative of H respect to lambda times delta lambda. It's an infinitesimal change. And this generally does not commute with Hamiltonian, right? That's the reason why we get all dynamics and so on. So my trajectories do change. But then I can ask the question, can I find canonical transformation which undoes this change? So basically, I ask if I shift my x and p with some a, can I uh, obtain basically a perturbation which is diagonal with h, which doesn't change trajectory. So this is pictorially, it looks like this. So it's, it's more or less uh, clear, and then I'll show mathematically what this means. So imagine, I, translation's kind of trivial. If I move the box, I need to move uh, my, uh, my particle. Uh, so let me consider dilations, which are also intuitive, but a bit less trivial. So suppose I have some potential and I have this type of trajectory, which I mentioned, phase-based trajectory. And my stationary distribution is precisely this blue line, right? Now suppose I squeeze my potential. And of course my trajectory will change. It right now will be bigger in P and, 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 and uh, smaller in X. So it's clear what I need to do. My adiabatic transformation would be that I rescale x back and rescale p down, right? So, but now how do I say mathematically that I rescale by the same amount, which amount, right? And we can use exact same logic as uh, before. I want to create perturbation V which commutes with Hamiltonian. But this perturbation now consists of two parts. I change my parameter lambda like potential, and also I change back my coordinates. Uh, there is sign issue, but if you go there, with this example you can see, you, you, can un you want to undo this sort of transformation. There, there is why there is a minus sign. Anyway, th this is a convention, plus or minus. So basically, I want to say that my new Hamiltonian, so at lambda plus delta lambda, at new coordinates, commutes with old Hamiltonian and old coordinates. That's what I mathematically want to do. So once we realize that, uh, then it's very trivial to formalize this equation. So I just say that, again, d derivative of this h, full derivative with respect to lambda, will be like a partial derivative plus a contribution due to change of variables. And then, because dx d lambda is minus d a d p, so what I find that uh, my total change in the Hamiltonian should be partial derivative of lambda, uh, h with respect to lambda, that's your physical derivative, minus part which is due to changing coordinates. Okay, and I might be a little bit too fast, but if you do this, uh, you will see. Okay, so know what, what I'm telling you. I'm just saying you that adiabatic transformations in classical mechanics are such that uh, I, 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 this object, basically derivative of the Hamiltonian minus Poisson bracket, uh, has a vanishing Poisson bracket or commutes with the Hamiltonian. And actually, just from this very fact, 
we already see how this kind of related to integrability. I didn't say word integrable in this part of the work at all. Because if you think about what is G lambda, well, this is a conservation law. So basically, I'm telling you already that if I can undo my adiabatic transformation, I get a conservation law. So this kind of immediately hints that adiabatic transformations are related to chaos, right? So again, if A exists, I did not tell you this A exists, but if it does exist in a sense, it's a local well-defined operator and so on and so forth, then it means I can form a conservation law, conjugate to lambda. And in some sense, this is extension of Noether theorem because symmetries are special transformations when d lambda h is zero. So if I have like rotational symmetry, I rotate and my Hamiltonian doesn't change in the new frame. So I'm just saying it's a little bit beyond Noether theorem. So all adiabatic transformations, not just symmetry transformations, they come with conservation laws. So there is a interesting corollary of this, which I'm not going to discuss. It could be like a separate course, but which I think is very interesting, that also if we uh, um, have this generator of, of um, uh, adiabatic transformation, basically if this equation can be solved, then I can do what's known as counter-adiabatic driving, which was introduced actually not so long ago by um, uh, Rice, Anyway, uh, by Rice in, in, in Chicago and Demir Plack and Rice, and, and then by Berry independently. And the idea is kind of very simple. It's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, if I, if I want to take, I, I'm not going to experiment with this, but suppose I have a glass of water and I want to bring it across the room, I can do it fast and then I splash the water. This is my non-adiabatic effects I'm talking about. But if I tilt it, I will not splash it, I'll splash it less. So it's the same idea here. So if I apply uh, a drive with Hamiltonian H plus lambda dot A, then in the moving frame, my Hamiltonian will be just H. But it's preserve, it preserves trajectories. So it means that nothing will happen with my stationary trajectories, with stationary distribution. And uh, then, of course, you can do infinitely fast adiabatic processes. You can reach Carnot efficiency of the engines. You can do many, many wonderful, wonderful things. You can basically beat uh, dissipation and so on and so forth. And of course, the trick is w that uh, and there is one caveat. Then in generic chaotic systems, actually, this equation does not have a solution. So actually, the first person who realized this, to my knowledge, was again Chris Yerzinski a long time ago, back in 95. It's interesting, he was not really interested even in these questions. He was asking whether you can define Berry phase in chaotic classical systems, and I'll come a little bit to that. So chaos is, is important. So now let me go to quantum systems. And there, actually, it's much more uh, intuitively clear, I would say, uh, what we mean by adiabatic transformations. So uh, first, let me uh, again uh, start from the same setup as in classical systems. Suppose I want to solve time-dependent Schrodinger equation when Hamiltonian depends on some parameter which changes in time. So think about the same setup. I have a piston which moves and so on, but now my system is quantum. Then what I can do, instead of defining time-dependent transformations, I can define basis, time-dependent basis. So in this case, the basis which depends on some parameter lambda which can change in time, right? So usually when we do all exercises in quantum mechanics, we expand our wave function in a fixed basis, right? But nothing prevents us from expanding in a moving basis. So think about this again, I'm moving a box. It's much more natural to expand my wave function in eigenstates which move together with the box, right? So now if I do this, I get time dependence which comes from sort of two sources. One is that my coefficients still depend on time. My wave function in a train depends on time, right? But also my basis states depend on time. And here I will immediately, I, again, I have a freedom of defining what these eigenstates are. I will focus on eigenstates of instantaneous Hamiltonian. because This is related to adiabatic transformation. 
Now, if I plug this to Schrodinger equation, then I will see again I will have two contributions. One comes from derivative of coefficients, and another comes from derivative of eigenstates. And I can use a chain rule, because my phi ends depend on parameter lambda, but lambda depends on time. And now what I'm going to do is exact same trick as in classical mechanics. I will move this term to the right and interpret it as a correction to the Hamiltonian. Oh, and of course, I pressed the wrong button. So, and what happens, derivative which acts only on these coefficients, I will call moving derivative. And that's exact same meaning as in classical systems, right? So this derivative ignores the fact that basis depends on time, right? So, and then I can say uh, that my Schrodinger equation in moving frame, so I kind of expand in the moving basis, but pretend that basis doesn't depend on time. So I only look into coefficients. So it still has uh, the form of the Schrodinger equation, but with modified Hamiltonian, and modification is exactly the same as uh, in classical physics, it's lambda dot times A, where A here I define as a matrix. It's a matrix of derivative D by D lambda, right? I can basically say, say my A will be derivative operator I H bar D by D lambda. So now uh, I, I can sandwich it between eigenstates and I say, uh, uh, my Hermitian operator lambda is defined through matrix elements of derivatives acting on eigenstates. If I know uh, this is definition eigenstate basis, but if I know in one basis, I know in another basis. Okay. So basically, uh, I can define this adiabatic gauge potential. This is definition as a derivative operator in the sense I just described. You can immediately see it's a Hermitian operator. It just follows from the fact that if I differentiate pi m n for m not equal to n, actually even for m equals to n, it's a Kronecker delta. I mean, derivative is always zero because it's Kronecker delta, right? Uh, uh, then uh, you'll see I get derivative of phi m and derivative of, oh, I think I, sorry for in this. It should be still the same order m and n. So anyway, I have left derivative and right derivative. Oh, I think it's right. I just switched between this and this. Anyway, so I have left derivative and right derivative, and you see the derivative is like anti-Hermitian. But if I add i, it will be Hermitian. So this is a Hermitian operator. Then I can see, uh, I, actually I can define it in a basis independent way. We know that if I go to some new basis, it's always some unitary rotation. Right, so you, it's basically matrix which diagonalizes your Hamiltonian, right? And then uh, if I act with derivative operator on, on, on this, I will see, oh, sorry. I'm getting tired. My hands give up first. Okay. Yeah, so. Uh, now, if I act on derivative, I only act on the unitary, and there is a simple trick. I have d unitary d lambda, I multiply by u dagger u, this gives me back an eigenstate, and then I find that this operator is, is this adiabatic gauge potential just given by this. So it's basically derivative of the unitary times u dagger. Again, it's one line exercise to check that it's a Hermitian operator. And let me just show through examples that this beast is exactly the same as we define in classical systems. Instead of showing it in full generality, let me go to examples which we just analyzed. So let's consider translations. So then my eigenstates phi n of x and lambda just phi n of x minus lambda, right? If I have particle in a box or some potential and lambda is a position of the box, then my eigenstates depend only on x minus lambda, right? So now if I differentiate this with respect to lambda, you see it's the same as minus derivative with respect to x. But minus derivative with respect to x is a momentum operator. So I see that my gauge potential is momentum. As we know, of course, it's translated. So now if I do dilations, so my eigenstates will be phi of x over lambda, but they need to divide by square root of lambda, right? Because if I integrate phi squared, it should be one. It should be lambda independent. So now if I differentiate this with respect to lambda, I will get one contribution from this guy, and this will be just, uh, <clears throat> well, ih bar comes from definition, I'll get one over two lambda, right? One half comes from square root. 
Uh, and then I get another derivative coming from this x over lambda. Again, when I differentiate respect to lambda, I'll get it's the same as x times derivative d by dx. And then I get minus 1 over lambda squared. It translates 1 over lambda. Anyway, if you stare at this, you will see that you get nothing but xp plus px over 2 lambda. And this is, of course, symmetrized form, Hermitian form of dilation operator. Remember, it was xp over lambda. So it's exact same thing. So you, you see that uh, this, this is basically the same object. Well, I defined it through derivatives of eigenstates, but this is, of course, not very practical definition because if I know eigenstates, I don't even need to, to know generate. I have them. Uh, but we can <coughs> um, um, uh, sort of make this definition more practical by using first-order non-degenerate perturbation theory. And again, you, you don't really need it. It's one way to derive results which are sort of general. You know, what is derivative of eigenstates with respect to lambda? It's actually a change of infinitesimal change of eigenstate if I change parameter lambda to lambda plus delta lambda, right? And this is my first order perturbation theory, which tells me what happens. So what I need to do, I need to sum over all virtual states, uh, states m not equal to n, matrix element of the perturbation, right, which is the lambda h, divided by energy denominator. So now I multiply by IH bar, and I see that, <coughs> oh, sorry, this should be d lambda H, I apologize. So I see that uh, uh, this matrix elements of A are given by this. So again, this uh, looks a little bit abstract. Uh, yeah, I think I skipped this. But you can now recover the classical equation by doing a simple trick. I multiply both sides of this equation by En minus En. And then, if you stare carefully, uh, what I get here, En minus En times A lambda, this is nothing but the commutator of A lambda and H. Because H, when it hits N, gives me En. This H, when it hits M, gives me En. So actually, what I see is that for all matrix elements, Uh, basically all of diagonal matrix elements. I'm using non-degenerate perturbation theory. So here M not equal to N. Uh, this object, D lambda H plus I over H bar commutator of A lambda and H, uh, uh, should have no of diagonal matrix elements. Diagonal matrix elements are actually arbitrary. And in fact, expectation value of this adiabatic gauge potential are very connections. That's what you usually know it for the ground state. This is what gives aronoff bohm effect and so on. So many interesting features and so on. So, but they're arbitrary. So now how you mathematically say that the matrix can have arbitrary diagonal elements and no of diagonal elements? Well, if you think about it, this is the matrix which commutes with the Hamiltonian. So once we connect the dots, we actually see that this adiabatic gauge potential satisfies exact same equation as I wrote classically. But instead of Poisson bracket, you have I over H bar times commutator. And this is exactly expected. Uh, in wrong direction. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Yes, 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 it's, it's a very good point. Yes, so quantum mechanically, it always exists, but yeah, give me a, uh, yeah, the five minutes and I'll get there. So let me just say in words, there is alternative derivation of the same result where you don't need to introduce eigenstate, first order perturbation theory, and so on. It's also like very simple. So what you want to say is that if you have some Hamiltonian of H lambda, you want to find unitary, which diagonalizes it, right? So, but what it means, it means for any lambda, this is diagonal matrix. So it means that for any lambda, this matrix commutes with itself. Now I just make a differential statement out of this. I just say, if I differentiate this with respect to lambda, its commutator with h must be zero. And actually, if I do this, it actually should be u dagger u, uh, h u, anyway. So if you do this mass, you'll actually arrive to the same equation. Yeah, I, I'm coming to uh, this. So this is like, as I promised, so time after time, I'll give some short mini summaries. So uh, if you 
skipped the details, so that's what you really need to know. So in classical systems, we can define this adiabatic GH potential as generator of canonical transformations which preserve trajectories. And they're associated with the conservation law that this beast commutes with uh, H. So in quantum systems, I introduced a similar object uh, by inspection, right? which is basically derivative of the unitary operator which diagonalizes Hamiltonian or derivative of eigenstates. And this satisfies basically the same equation. I have associated conservation law which commutes with the Hamiltonian. And I keep H bar specifically to just to highlight that classical limit is well defined so that it's the same object. Uh, and I, I think now I'm getting to this question. So how it's related to chaos It's here. So uh, in both quantum and classical systems, uh, ex existence of local adiabatic transformations is associated with existence of local conservation law. So somehow it's related, uh, as I mentioned, to chaos or integrability. And classically, we did not prove that AGP exists. I just wrote equation, but I didn't give you solution, right? How do we know that this equation has it? Quantum mechanically, I wrote you a solution. There is always a unitary, so there is always a solution. So I'm kind of contradicting myself, right? Because we can always think about classical mechanics as some limit of quantum mechanics, h bar goes to zero. But the question is, is this solution meaningful? In a sense that, is it well defined in the limit of h bar goes to zero? So, and uh, this is what I'm going to address. Of course, you, you can imagine that it's meaningful if I have integrable systems, and it's not really meaningful if I can have chaotic systems. Okay, so I think I try to finish on time, so I consider a couple of uh, simple examples. Uh, and they already show that this how this machinery is kind of related to very interesting physics like integrability. So I'll sketch it, but it's, it's actually a very fun uh, calculation I, I urge you to do. Uh, so I, you kind of recover. Uh, anyway, um, I'll show you what you find. So let me just consider a very simple example. It's integrable. So I have particle with some potential V of X and lambda, and I can ask when I can write a simple adiabatic gauge potential. So when I can solve these equations. I didn't specify what lambda is. So essentially, I'll do quantum derivation, but it's the same classically. I know that there should be some conservation law, which I formulated. Now, what is this conservation law? Well, because it's particle in one dimension, it can be only powers of H, right? Because there is nothing else conserved. We just discussed it. So then I can say that my G should be A naught times H plus B naught times H squared plus dot, dot, dot. Okay. Now, if you stare a bit more, you just see that this part is real for my Hamiltonian. So this also must be real, which means that A should be imaginary. But if A is imaginary, it should be odd in momentum, right? Because P is. So I can find A as an odd polynomial in momentum. So let me try to do this. So the first thing would be that I try A would be P times some function of F plus F times some function of P. This is the first order approximation. So I'll finish this example and we'll go for lunch. So now you can probably follow and if it's too fast then you can sort of do it yourself offline but it's a very simple calculation. So I have this ansatz and I want to compute commutator. It's actually usually easier to compute Poisson bracket. So d lambda h is just my d lambda v, right? And then I will get what? I will get, uh, uh, if I look in, this is Poisson bracket, it's d a d p times d h dx minus opposite, right? Uh, d a d p will be f, right? And so uh, uh, d v d h dx will be d v dx, and then the opposite will be, I will get derivative of this respect to s, it will be p times f prime, 
times derivative of h with respect to p, which will be p over m. So anyway, so I get uh, g has this form, and it's quadratic in p, so I can use only power, first power of h, because higher power of give, give me p power 4, so I can only have one coefficient a. And then I, I need uh, to be consistent, and then immediately I see that uh, my function dxf should be constant, right? Because the only way I can, this can be equal to this if dxf is x independent. So I immediately see that this or works only when f is linear function of x. It's like some ax plus b. Again, to ignore it just for some, yeah, well, I guess two comes if I mention, mention them. Uh, so, and then I have another equation. So. Uh, to solve, and then uh, this I, I, I skip. You can just check that the solution would be of this form where gamma and xi are arbitrary functions. But to make long story short, if you say that f is linear in x, then remember b are just translations, right? Because if f is constant, my a is p. So if I have non-zero b, I have translations. And a, I have dilations because it's xp. So it turns out that if I want my adiabatic gauge potential to be linear in p, the only thing I can do are translations and dilations. There are no other adiabatic transformations. So I gave you two simple examples, and you can ask, why don't you add one more example? It doesn't exist from this family. That's it in one dimension, right? And then in order to, um, uh, v has to satisfy extra constraints, so it should be, a function of x minus xi, which corresponds to translations, and this you can figure out. So this, uh, this requirement uh, that v is scale invariant. Uh, so if I dilate it, I get basically the same Hamiltonian. So if I have x squared plus x power 4, I have to have certain relation between them to, to have a dilation. Okay, and this was actually found by first, it's, uh, see, it's already I'm coming to relatively recent years. Uh, by Daphne, Ryzinski, and Del Campo. They didn't use exact same method, but, but it's got this. Uh, I'll take two, two more minutes, and I will just flash the result. What will happen if you go to next order polynomial? Right? So I'll just say, how about that? We now make our A a little bit more complicated. We add P cube. So, then I'm skipping lots of details, but this is really straightforward. You write exact same consistency equations. And amazingly, you recover KDV equation, kortevec de Vries equation, which describes solitons and water. And actually, this result is still known in integrability theory, but here it just comes from a very simple requirement that your generator of adiabatic transformations is local. So your potential should satisfy this third order equation, uh, this third derivative actually is quantum, uh, and it stabilizes solitons. So uh, I guess I'll finish this part. Doesn't work. Okay. Uh, with uh, sort of um, an interesting statement that if your potential has a shape of this soliton, then actually you can implement dissipationless driving. Uh, very quickly, and I think this is uh, a little bit non-intuitive. So what I'm saying is that these are pictures of the soliton. So these are very reasonable potentials, right? So this is single soliton of KDV, this is double soliton. And what I'm saying is actually already, uh, I would say, very unintuitive statement. So let's imagine they have particles, say non-interacting particles, which move gas of the particle. And I want to move this potential very, very quickly, arbitrary quickly. And then the statement that if I add this counter term to the Hamiltonian, which is exactly my adiabatic gauge potential, it's negative, but it comes from plus sign anyway, then I will suppress any dissipative effect. So I'll just move my potential through the particles without creating a ripple. It's sort of like this picture from movie being there. I mean, there are two amazing things. I mean, one is that this guy works on the water, but another that there is no single ripple. So he walks on the water adiabatically, and this is what you can do. Moreover, it's even, even paradoxically, there are two soliton solutions. So if, if those who know, this bigger soliton moves faster than slower soliton. So if you think you just create this potential, it's like two tweezers, 
and you exchange them. And again, uh, for this setup, if you apply this counter term, which is a bit weird, like cubic in momentum, it's not something we see, uh, then you can suppress dissipation completely. Okay, I think it's probably a good point to stop. So tomorrow I will try to connect this to chaos more precisely. And thank you for your attention. Are there some questions? Uh, looks like everyone is hungry. So uh, up there is a cafeteria, and we meet here at 2. Okay. Thank you, Anatoly.